Hi, everybody. Welcome to Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Today, we're at Viviano's Restaurant at the Valley Forge Casino Resort in King of Prussia. Coming up today, we'll be taking a look at a recent ruling at Augusta and the Masters <laughs> involving Tiger Woods that raised a few eyebrows. And we'll have more on the U.S. Open at Marion in June and why some well, people think it may be one of the toughest venues in recent open history. It's all coming up next on Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank. Susquehanna Bank, doing what counts. By PlayACGolf.com. Visit PlayACGolf.com to plan your Atlantic City Golf getaway, where the play continues well into the night. By Club Champion, better fit, lower scores. Visit their Balakinwood location. By Temple Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, now located in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Call 800 Temple Med. And by the Philadelphia Section PGA, experts in the game and business of golf. Defining a target, realizing a dream. Susquehanna Bank can help you get your plans off the ground. Whether you're sending kids to college or doing something special for yourself. Susquehanna's financial advisors are worth talking to. We can help you find the smartest way to borrow money and save money in the process. Susquehanna Bank, doing what counts for dreamers like you. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Welcome back to Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Today, we are at the Valley Forge Casino Resort and the beautiful and wonderful Viviano's Restaurant with celebrity chef Tony Clark. You've seen Tony already here on Inside Golf. And today, we have our panel that includes Bob Shepard, noted Philadelphia area PGA professional for years, author, gives great lessons if you're looking for them at Five Ponds in Warminster. Joe Logan is from MyPhillyGolf.com. Talk about noted, this guy is known all around the world, not just in Philadelphia and MyPhillyGolf.com, but around the world, longtime golf writer. And Tom Carpus, he's the professional at Kenneth Square Golf and Country Club, and also, and one of the reasons why he's joining us today, Tom is uh, vice chairman of the Rules Committee for the PGA of America. And when it comes to knowing the rules, Tom Carpus knows the rules. Speaking of which, Tom, how many years have you been down at Augusta and part of the Rules Committee down there? Uh, this year was my fourth time. Fourth time. And this year, there were some notable rules that were enforced, and it just so happened to be in the middle of that second round on hole number 15, and everybody who watched the Masters knows exactly what I'm talking about. Tiger had to uh, drop a ball because his third shot into that par five hit the flagstick, went into the hazard, and he had to reload, as we like to say. And guess who was standing within 50 yards on that uh, 15th fairway of Tiger Woods? None other than yourself. What did you see? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I saw him, what I thought was drop it in the right spot. I mean, I literally was standing near the grandstand, not far from the drop zone. He walked over to the drop zone very briefly took a peek and then immediately turned back. His caddy never moved. He got a ball, took one step back and dropped it. And it was all like very, uh, very quickly done. I mean, I've looked at the video multiple times because I kept thinking to myself, did I miss something? When the call came in and the committee looked at it, they essentially saw the same thing I did, which was no no breach of a rule. Let's not jump ahead of okay, ourselves. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, but I appreciate that. Get excited that. about this. Uh, Joe, what happened really that kind of touched off the firestorm was the post-round interview that he gave on uh, ESPN, I believe, and wh where he said to the uh, interviewer that he moved back, I think he said a couple of yards, dropped the ball because he wanted to hit the same club. He figured, you know, that his interpretation was, at least the rules say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it has to be dropped as near as possible to the original shot. Is that basically what triggered the whole thing? Uh, yes, I mean, and that's the lapse I don't understand. Is Even I know to drop it as close as possible. So how Tiger Woods in the heat of battle made that mistake, 
I don't I don't get it, but you know I haven't been uh, near the lead in the Masters, so maybe uh, even he gets nervous. Uh, but it but it was essentially dropping a dime on himself in the post round interview. <laughs> this sent up red flags. Well, at least he was honest. I mean, you know, right. he, he admitted what he did. Now, Shep, right. where uh, David Eager comes in, David Eager. Who, who was a well-known amateur and now a uh, member of the Champions Tour. Right, right. Uh, and rules official. And, and, rules and a, official. And a rules right. official. Uh, heard the interview and uh, saw the replay, I guess, and the divot, the original divot, and he put a call in to another member that he knew down there at, at Augusta saying, hey, you better check the videotape because there may have been an infraction, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly right. Th it's, it's th this TV thing, I'm sure Tommy will get you on this better than I will, but this... TV call-in has been going on for a few <laughs> years now, and it's it's rearranged the uh, spontaneity of it. We have rules in, in the rules of golf. There's rules to protect the referees from making bad decisions, and uh, the final rule is that once a, a rule is made, it is final, and th it can't be overturned even if it's a wrong rule. So, since that time, they've got these TV rules in where they've protected the field. Basically, is what they're doing. They're trying to get rid of. Uh, uh, on irreconcilable differences. Now, Tom, <laughs> uh, Fred Ridley is a member of Augusta. He's a former U.S. amateur champion. He's a head of the competition committee for the Masters Tournament. A and he's, you know, been around. He's been around the block. And he makes the ultimate call on something like this, right? Yes, he was chairman of the Rules Committee. So he consulted with Mark Russell from the PGA Tour and another gentleman by the name of Jim Reinhart, who is a former USGA executive committee member, a very top rules guy in the country, and they basically uh, spoke with Tiger and then made the call to, in, to uh, give him a two-stroke penalty. Right. Did they get try to get the Tiger before he signed his scorecard with an incorrect call? Well, the events, are, uh, the correct, the events were David Eager called in when he watched Tiger drop the ball. Mm -hmm. So they immediately got this phone call. Well, he called one of the other gentlemen on the rules committee, a PGA Tour official, who then went to Fred Ridley, or Mark Russell and Fred Ridley. So Fred Ridley looks at the video and basically sees exactly what I saw and didn't think anything of it. And at that point, they felt like the book was closed. This ruling was made, no penalty. His interview was after he signed the scorecard. Now, they looked at the video before he signed the card. I think he was on the 18th hole when they convened, and they opted not to speak to him in scoring, which... Truth be told, I think they would have preferred to have done that because it would have uh, alleviated all the, the impressions people have that they were making an exception for Tiger, which is totally not the case. You don't think so? No, sir. Okay. Absolutely Because not. a lot of people do. I mean, let's face it. He is the marquee guy, one of them, but right at the top. And a lot of people thought maybe he was getting a pass because of that. And there is that rule, Joe, the, the exemption. If they messed up, well, then it's not Tiger's fault. True. And therefore... <laughs> They could give him a two-shot penalty, what they did, but he could still not have to be disqualified. That was their rationale. They said, we told him, or we didn't tell him, you know, we let him sign the card without bringing it to his attention. So we can't now, in retrospect, go back and blame him for something that we didn't tell him about. Will Fred Ridley be around next year <laughs> on the uh, rules committee, Chef? <laughs> There's a... I don't know. You don't know. It's, it's, it's Maybe I Tom do. knows. He'll be around. He? he is a powerful, powerful <laughs> been, member been, of yeah, Augusta yeah. National. He's a former president of the USGA. <laughs> yeah. He's a big deal lawyer in Tampa, Florida. He's he's in like Flint. I mean, he's, you know, and he's I'm sure Tommy will agree too. Well, that all I, the big guys were there. It wasn't he like there made was some the They made the correct ruling. At the end of the day, the penalty fit the crime, and I think the people in the rules world, I think, would all agree that he. The, the, he got the proper penalty. In fact, there's some people out there who think he should have got no penalty, that he dropped it close enough. And both the USGA and the RNA and the PGA have all since weighed in and said, we agree with the ruling. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't do a good okay. job of selling it. I Case don't know. closed? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is it? Hey, there was another big ruling, and we'll have Tom's take on that and Shep's. And when we come back, Joe's going to uh, shuttle seats with Harry Mays, who's going to join the panel to talk about the uh, slow play penalty that was imposed on that 14-year-old Chinese player. It almost cost him in making the cut, but he did play on Saturday and Sunday. It's coming up next, our rules committee here. We'll talk about that as Inside Golf continues from the Valley Forge Casino Resort and Viviano's Italian Restaurant. Hi everyone, Ron Jaworski here. I just want to let you in on a little secret. Here, 
just outside of Atlantic City, you'll find some of the top-rated golf courses in the world. Imagine playing these championship courses during the day, then playing your hand at something else at night. Casinos, bars, clubs, shows. Atlantic City has something for all the ways you like to play. So pack your bags for the ultimate golf getaway. Do AC and play AC Golf. AC Golf, where the play continues well into the night. Welcome back to Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Once again, we're at the beautiful Valley Forge Resort Casino and Viviano's Restaurant. It is one of eight restaurants here at the Valley Forge Casino Resort. All of a sudden, we've uh, kind of changed things a little bit. We still have Tom Carpus. We still have Bob Shepard. And in between, we have Harry Mays from 97.5 the fanatic who is sitting in on this segment. And once again, we're talking rules and the recent masters. We already, I don't think we exhausted the whole Tiger Woods drop thing, but now let's move on. Actually, this happened before that controversy. And this involved 14 year old Guan Chen Lang, who uh, was playing on Friday and he was assessed a two stroke penalty for slow play. And one of his playing partners in a threesome was two-time Masters winner Ben Crenshaw. I'm sure he was a little embarrassed by that whole episode. He wasn't assessed slow play. And, Tom, why not? Why just, you know, the amateur and not his playing partners? Well, the procedure is this. If your group is both over the allotted time established by the committee and out of position with the group in front of you, your group can be spoken to, essentially. And they were spoken to before they got put on the clock. What, what hole did they get? Uh, they got told? put on the clock on number 12. Okay. But they were, the, the, the problem was identified before that. So they were asked to, to, hey, let's pick it up here. But finally, they weren't picking up any time. The committee had no choice to put them on the clock on number 12. So that means now all three players are timed. And they have essentially 40 seconds to make a stroke. When it's, when it's their turn to play without interference or distraction. Shep, personally, it seemed odd that, uh, you know, Ben Crenshaw or somebody didn't go up to him and say, hey, you, we got to pick it up, long, yeah. right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, you got to take a lot of things into consideration. I think he knew what he was doing, and I think it was very important to him that he do it correctly. And I think he was second-guessing himself. I, yeah, I'm not up to date with what his real thoughts were, but I think he was second-guessing himself and trying to do the right thing, trying to get the right yardage, listening to the – other players, uh, maybe the audience. <laughs> Pretty big stage. Big, it's big. 14. <laughs> well, all of a sudden now, yeah. he's got this. It was an RNA guy, too, wasn't it, that came up to him? Uh, well, it was initially? John Paramore, who yeah, was Paramore. chief referee for the European Tour for okay. 30 years. Okay. So he explained to uh, Guan, hey, we got to pick it up and you're on the clock. Harry, p potentially, uh, the two shot penalty, which he was, uh, one shot. or one shot, one penalty, shot yeah. ul ultimately could have put him out, out out of the cut Saturday and Sunday play he managed to make the cut good for him do you think do you, what would have been the repercussions if that had happened bad weekend for Augusta <laughs> National isn't bad weekend for the Masters uh <laughs> on many fronts and I'll tell you what if he wouldn't have made the cut as a result of this no disrespect uh to Mr. Carpus but <laughs> he's not it, wearing a green jacket it, it would not have looked good it would have looked like hey we you know we'd like that this kid is in this tournament he won it by virtue of winning a a tournament that we sanction essentially around the world to come here, but he shouldn't be making the cut at the age of 14. That's what it would have looked like. That's how you think a lot. That's of how a lot of people those, would have looked uh, at guys in the at media it. tent yeah. would have mm -hmm. rationaled it. Huh? I you, think so. Do you think that that now I know you're going to say that had nothing to do with. Well, it. here's what I can tell you. Okay. I can tell you this: that over the course of time, any time players have been penalized for slow play, it's the last thing a committee wants to do. The last thing John Paramore wanted to do was to be out there timing this young man. There were other groups out there that were, had been timed that day. Now, here's the thing. He took more than 40 seconds. He gets a bad time on the 13th hole. So he gets a warning. Now, to me, once you've been warned, the red flag should have been up and he should have been playing faster. And I witnessed it when he came through 15 and 16, and he took forever to play. Now, did they Paramore did everything come up to you, or is Paramore watching them? Well, he's walking with the group. They don't, okay. use, they, they don't use carts when they're timing. So John was walking with him, and he walked. I was behind the green on 15 at that point. So he was under the TV tower timing the tee shot on 16. And it wasn't until 17 that he did get a penalty. But it's the last thing that John wanted to do, and I can tell you there was no other choice in the matter. Uh, and I think the, basically the way we do it, the way we think of it is, 
remove the face, remove the name, you have golfers. You have a policy, a pace of play guideline. You follow it, you enforce the rules. Doesn't matter who it is. Harry, I want to give you the final say. Well, were there complaints? Because I, I know like Bernhard Langer is one of the slowest players on the face of the earth, and he's won that event twice. And uh, you know, there's other players that are notoriously slow. Were there complaints about the kid, or was this sort of singling the kid out to oh, there's, it's not send about a message? Not about complaints. This is about basically his position. With Here's the thing. If he would have played every stroke in less than 40 seconds, there wouldn't have been a problem. If their group would have caught up to the group in front of them and got back in position, there would have been no problem. To your and, knowledge, and were there any other play, any other groups that were put on the clock? Over there the were course? several groups on the clock okay. on, uh, on every day. Every day of every day, there were groups that were spoken to, groups that were being timed, and unfortunately, and usually what happens, I mean, I've seen it a hundred times if I've seen it once. If you get a bad time, you watch players move very, very quickly. And this young man, and I think Lee Westwood, I think, said it best. He said, we should blame ourselves because this young man grew up watching us play golf and he's got a routine that's long. You're going to be at uh, Marion for the Open? I'll be there as working? a spectator. You're not I won't be working. Be working. No, our You're chairman not, okay. will be there. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment, and we'll uh, have our panel talk about the upcoming U.S. Open at Marion. It's just about a month away. As we continue with Inside Golf from the Valley Forge Casino and Resort and Viviano's Restaurant. In, in bunker. Early mornings, late nights, and way too many takeout dinners. Running a business takes energy, determination, and sacrifice. And whether you're a startup, well-established, or somewhere in between, the people of Susquehanna Bank have the knowledge to help you succeed. From cash management solutions to the benefits of local loan decisions, we help keep your business moving ahead. Susquehanna Bank, doing what counts for businesses like yours. Member FDIC. going to see more birdies at Marion. You're going to see guys on certain holes take irons off the tee, yet his fellow competitor may take a three-wood, somebody else may take a driver. Uh, you play aggressively and you don't execute, you're going to be penalized. Welcome back to Inside Golf presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. We are at the Valley Forge Casino and Resort, specifically at Viviano's Italian Restaurant. Great food here at Viviano's all the time with Celebrity Chef Tony Clark, and we're just maybe 20 minutes away from uh, one of the biggest events on the golf calendar coming up in just a month, the U.S. Open at Venerable Marion Golf Club. Our panel, Bob Shepard, Joe Logan is back from myphillygolf.com, and Mr. Rules, also the professional at Kennett Square, Tom Corpus. And you won't be working at uh, Marion, and your official title as a uh, rules guy, you'll be there as a spectator. Yes, sir. Like 25,000 other people <laughs> every day. Mike Davis, sec executive director of the USGA, recently was at Marion Shep, and uh, as we heard him say, there'll probably be more birdies in this U.S. Open over the four rounds of competition at Marion than there have been in recent Marion comp or, uh, U.S. Open competitions. However, doesn't necessarily translate into low scores because there's also some holes out there that are going to reach up and grab you, especially if the weather means no rain and things are dry and the greens are fast and the rough is thick. You think he's right? I think he is. There is a, a situation here that's really pretty interesting if you look at it, in my mind anyhow. When I used to play Marion, I used to like it a lot because it was nine holes that were under 400 yards, and that's rare to get that many quote, birdie holes, uh, there's only two par fives. So now we've, we've killed 11 holes. We've actually had 11 birdie holes. And the rest of the holes, if you can hold on to the handlebars, you could have a pretty nice round of golf. <laughs> the trouble is, when you cross that street and get over to 13 in, you got to really pay attention. There's a lot of trouble out there. Webb Simpson said, the defending champion, holes 14 through 18 may be the toughest stretch of five closing holes he's ever played. He's certainly not the first person to say that. <laughs> Everybody, uh, I remember won't talking. Be the, won't be the last. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, you know, listen to Bob run through the birdie holes. Mm. Uh, you forget, 
they got two of the toughest par threes I've ever seen. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, 17 is this right. monster 230-yard par three. And then uh, number three. three. Yeah. And they're going to play the tees back. They could play those tees back, you know, 200 yards. That's a very hard green to get. And then have a little hitch in your swing on nine. That yeah. would make you nervous. Right, right. 13, right. you just feel like uh, going to the car to go home. <laughs> they they <laughs> have rerouted, there. you know, a lot of the fairways there. And we've we've touched on that. We talked to Matt Schaefer over a year ago here on Inside Golf, the superintendent, and he took us through the whole thing. And actually, Mike Davis said, Tom, that they have widened some of the fairways over the past year because they looked at it, and there were some landing areas of like 20 yards on some of these fairways. And there's no first cut of rough. But there will be, depending on the hole, he says, a graduated stepped cut or a stepped cut so they're going to like layer it okay so you may be only a yard off the fairway and it won't be as penal maybe as being two yards off do you think that's a good idea well they've been using that at previous opens mike has made that adjustment with and i think what they're probably going to do at marion for the really long holes they'll use the graduated concept but holes let, let's say like number two which is a par five that, that fairway is very narrow. In fact, that's one of the ones I think they added. They went back to the left a little bit because it was too narrow. Uh, there, they'll probably, you'll be just right from the fairway right into rough. Or holes like uh, seven and eight, short holes that demand a very tight, very good tee shot, uh, an accurate shot, not length. Holes like 10 and 11. I think that's where you're going to see fairway and then high rough, and you're going to have to hit the fairway. Uh, I asked him the question, Joe, does he set the course up according to scoring? And, he, uh, you know, he doesn't want to come out flat out and say the USGA does that. But it's pretty much a known fact, whether it's Mike Davis or, you know, uh, who is Boatwright, A.J. Boatwright. P.J. Uh, Boatwright, PJ back Boatwright back from back in the 80s. I mean, whoever sets it up is keeping that in the back of their mind. Right. And, and Mike sets them up now. And I mean, that's all. the USGA never likes to really come out and say that. But look at the result. You know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, come on. Uh, and and that's what they go. What surprised me at the media day thing uh, was when he said if it rains, the winning score could go as much as 15 shots lower if the course is wet. That's huge. That is an astronomical difference between wet and dry. The only time, this will be the fifth open at Marion, uh, going back to, uh, what was it, uh, Olin Dutra won 34. in uh, 34. And the only time the score at Marion was under par was in 81 with David Graham. I think he was seven under par. Uh, when Hogan won in 50, and I know you weren't there, he was seven over, right? right? He was seven over par for regulation. And, and then, of course, went into the um, playoff against Lloyd Magrum and the, the late great Tom Fazio. George Fazio. Or George Fazio. But what's going to happen? Uh, give, me a, give me a winning score. Well, sport. I think... The, the, the wet conditions, what happens is now the fairways get soft. To me, that's, the, that's why the scores get better because not only are the greens softer, but now when you hit it in the fairway, fair, holes like number four where the fairway sits like this, 18, where you have to hit the fairway and keep it on there. If it's soft, your ball is going to stay there and you're going to have an easier play and then the greens are softer. I th I, in my mind, I've always, I think if it's firm and fast, I think three to five under is the winning score. If it gets wet, I think it's 10 to 12. Okay, you're right there with Mike Davidson. And we'll be back. We'll be joined by Harry Mays of 97.5 The Fanatic as our final segment of uh, this week's edition of Inside Golf from Viviano's Restaurant at the Valley Forge Casino Resort continues in just a moment. This has been Countdown to the 2013 U.S. Open at Murrian, presented by Temple Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, now located in Oaks, Pennsylvania. This is really a transformative time in the history of Temple Health. The right people are all coming together at the same time. Really outstanding physicians who are at the top of their field. To develop the most effective cancer treatments anywhere in the country, to educate the next generation of physicians. To move things from what we do in science. To bring that science to the care of patients. In the future, it's limitless. It's a closing hole where if you need to make par, you can't miss one shot. You've got to have four really good shots or you're going to make bogey or more. Welcome back to Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Our final segment today, 
We have brought back Harry Mays from 97.5 The Fanatic, joined by Tom Karpus, who's the head pro at Cannon Square, and Bob Shepard, Philadelphia PGA member and instructor of golf at Five Ponds in Warminster. Gentlemen, we heard Mike Davis there say that he thinks 18, the closing hole at this year's U.S. Open at Marion, could be the most difficult closing hole in recent open memory. Why is that, Mr. Carpus? Well, the fairway is about like a bowling alley. That's about <laughs> how wide it is. So trying to hit that, the pressure of the moment, the length, and then uphill into The new a, tee. How about the new tee box? Just, I mean, it, depending on where they play it, depending on wind, first thing is to hit the fairway. That's the hardest part. And then you have a long shot uphill to a very, very difficult green. So it's got all the elements and just the pressure of the moment, 18. Harry, uh, Lee Trevino, Harry, in uh, this month's edition of Golf Digest, because it's Marion and he won there in 71 in the playoff with Nicholas, he thinks that scores are going to be high and that this will be the toughest four rounds of open competition that anybody in the field has seen. Now, nobody has played Marion in, obviously, 81. Half the field wasn't even born, probably. But Trevino thinks if it doesn't rain in June, now he did qualify it the first two weeks in June, he thinks this course is really going to reach up and grab these guys. Well, I hope it does. I mean, I, you know, I don't. You want to see those guys suffer, uh, right? No, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I, I'd like to see somewhere between maybe even par and, and two under, two over to two under in that, in that range win, win the tournament. I don't like to see torture, but I think it should come down to a torturous 18th hole for a great dramatic finish. Is there, is there a tent going to be nearby where Phil Mickels can, can, uh, can uh, <laughs> assuming he makes the slice cut. a driver? <laughs> Well, well yeah. he's not going to reach the clubhouse, <laughs> at least not on his drive, right? He may hit uh, something in the parking lot yeah. there. Yeah, that, that could be. Right. Okay, I'm not going to ask you for pairings, but I am going to ask you for winners in the last 30 seconds. Shep, give me two guys you think have a shot. I'm going to take a long shot with Lee Westwood. Going to get him out of the garage, Finally. get him tuned up, and get him out playing again. I think he's going to make a move. And I like this on Hill Cabrera's maneuver down there at the Masters. I think it might continue. I think he's excited about the majors. He's like a... a pony down at the Kentucky Derby. I think he's ready to go. Harry? I'll go with a guy who I like but's not playing very well, Louis Oosthuizen. I like his game. And Brent Snedeker. He's going to break through one of these days. Mr. Carr. He's Brent Snedeker is who I've been thinking because he hits it straight and he's a great putter. Yeah. And if I had to add one other, I do think um, someone like a David Toms. I don't even know if he's in the field, but wow. someone who's a straight hitter. Yeah. Keep it in very the fairway. consistent. Yeah. He's played there. He was uh, there last year, and so was Graham McDowell. That's it for Inside Golf as we take another look at the U.S. Open coming up in a month at Marion. Our thanks to the folks here at Valley Forge Casino Resort and the beautiful Viviano's Italian Restaurant. For Bob Shepard, Harry Mays, and Tom Carpus, I'm Harry Donahue. Remember, no matter how bad it's going for you, don't pick up, even on the 18th at Marion. And we'll see you next time on Inside Golf presented by Susquehanna Bank and Wealth Management. Inside Golf, presented by Susquehanna Bank. Susquehanna Bank, doing what counts. By PlayACGolf.com. Visit PlayACGolf.com to plan your Atlantic City Golf getaway, where the play continues well into the night. By Club Champion, better fit, lower scores. Visit their Ballot-Kinwood location. By Temple Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, now located in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Call 800 Temple Med and by the Philadelphia Section PGA, experts in the game and business of golf.